today we're talking to my son Jacob. He was my second youngest son and he um, has mild dyslexia and profound dysgraphia and probably mild or moderate dyscalculia as yeah. well. Um, so when he he was homeschooled for from sixth grade till he graduated from high school. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Oh, sorry. Fifth grade till the time he graduated from high school. And he graduated a year early and he took the California high school exit exam. And so we set up a 504 for him so that he could have accommodations for that test. And um, we were expecting him to need to use the accommodation for the writing but it turned out the math was actually harder for him than the writing portion of the test. Yeah, I was really surprised by that. <laughs> yeah, so he passed the writing one the first time around and needed to go back and take the, the math one. And he missed it by like two points. Mm -hmm. And it was algebra, um, which algebra is very hard for people with dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia. So um, it makes sense that and he, it took him a couple of years working on algebra to feel ready to um, take the algebra test. Yeah. So. And even then, I still felt like it was just enough to get me to eat by. I think when I did pass it, I just barely missed or pat, like got over the threshold for passing. So it it was a, a bare minimum kind of situation for me just because I knew that I needed enough information to get through it, but I also was having a hard time retaining a lot of the information. So I wasn't so much learning as I was trying to like just study it. for the test. Exactly. Which that's what most American kids do anyway, is they memorize the information to pass the tests to get through school. <laughs> okay. So Jacob, tell us about the best you can about your experience having profound dysgraphia. When was the first time that you noticed that writing was difficult? So, and like you're kind of alluding to, trying to describe dysgraphia as kind of a part of the issue in and of itself, that it's kind of like a, a kink in a hose where the water wants to flow out, but it just doesn't want to something's blocking it from getting out there. That's a great analogy. Um, and I would say I, I, the earliest I can think of is when I was doing like writing papers and stuff for like first grade, I always had a really hard time just putting stuff out. I mean, I, I was, uh, when I first moved out, I was actually looking at um, some of the old like elementary school grades that I had and everything in there, I basically turned in every paper late or never turned anything in because I would either forget it at home or get halfway through and just never finish writing it and just turn that in because I needed to turn something in. So, so poor executive functioning skills. That too. Yeah. So it's poor executive functioning skills and then also just uh, not, not being able to write either. So they both kind of played into each other. And I didn't really realize, I thought everyone had that same problem until probably about middle school when we were with uh, classical conversations and I had to write a paper like once a week and that was like pulling teeth, I'm sure you remember. Well, yeah, I mean, once <laughs> you started homeschooling and classical conversations was probably the first time you had to write papers yeah. homeschooling and um, I, you dictated every paper to me and it took us about seven hours to write a paper. Yeah, gotten a lot faster now. I, I can I can force myself. So I, I will say it's gotten easier as I've gotten older. And I think mostly, I, I think part of the issue that I had was I would overthink what I was writing. I would overthink how uh, what I was saying or what I was writing was being interpreted, uh, which made me sit and think about it longer, which would just kind of keep it from never coming out. So 
And Jacob is a perfectionist. Yeah. Which I think um, also makes it harder because you don't want to mess up. So you just keep trying, hoping that you'll get it perfect, but we can't get anything perfect in life. Yeah, and, and the more life I live, the more I realize that sometimes it's better to just have something rather than have something to be perfect. Uh-huh, yeah. So you said that um, you started having the problems in first grade. You also started asking to be homeschooled in first grade. Is there a correlation between the two, do you think? I think there's definitely some supporting factors with that. So it becomes a vicious cycle. I realize now that I have pretty bad social anxiety. So being in a building where you're surrounded by 20 other kids the entire time that you're there uh, can be very overstimulating. And then on top of that, you have schoolwork that struggling with, but the kids around me are finishing up and turning them in. I remember specifically, I think it was like a, a word scramble uh, speed quiz, so kind of like the where you'd have to do the math problems as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm one where you had like you had a, a word chart and you had to fill in as many words as you could and I would maybe get 10 words every time and it would be a kid who would get like 20 or 30 I would just be kind of sitting there thinking like well I'm not great at that but whatever but yeah so I think that on top of social anxiety and uh, the pressure that I would put on myself or that was there of like doing well in school made it challenging to continue to go into school. And so once you stopped going to school in fifth grade, mm -hmm. um, did, did the experience change for you? Yeah, so with homeschooling, I was able to focus a lot more on the parts of learning that I enjoyed and take the time to assess the parts that I didn't enjoy uh, and figure out how best to approach that problem. So it wasn't perfect, but I was able to spend seven hours writing one paper rather than trying to, I don't know, write it in class or having to take that as homework and yeah. And, and watching other kids get it written in two hours or whatever. Exactly, yeah. So help, yeah, it helped me focus on the parts of learning that I enjoyed and allowed me to take the time that I needed with the parts that, it, that were a struggle. And so let's talk more about the things that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, what, where do you see your strengths are and how, assumably they, your strengths were things that you enjoyed, is that correct or not? Um, I would say more or less. So I, really enjoyed history and uh, science. Uh, those were the two subjects that I was always excited for, that I would spend time in my own, like my own free time just researching and looking into because it, I, it was interesting to me. Um, language arts was always a struggle and math, most of it was geometry was the only part of math that I really felt like I had a good grasp on and still continue to have a good grasp on. Um, but yeah, I think that answers it. Well, in geometry, typically uh, people with one of the three Ds will do well in geometry because it is um, factual, it's part of everyday life, and so it, it's structured. Um, dyslexic people, dys graphic, dyscalculic people do not do as well with the arbitrariness um of algebra. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes sense. Um, and Jacob, at, since Jacob really liked science and I really did not like science, I would buy science kits and Jacob would teach himself and his brother who was only 16 months younger um the science and then just what six eight years later Jacob became a teacher yeah <laughs> so I was setting Jacob up for something and didn't even know that was 
that was happening. Which and I didn't realize it at the time, and I didn't realize it when I started teaching. But and I realize it now uh, when I really enjoy a subject or when a subject clicks for me, I'm able to. Ironic, because I'm having a harder time with it now. I'm able to uh, shoot. What's the word? Verbalize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm able to verbalize, I'm able to explain without hesitation how whatever it is meant to work. So when I was working with uh, 10 to 18 year olds and I was explaining how woodworking worked or uh, how to use a hand tool, a specific hand tool, anything like that, um, I used analogies all the time because I always understood things better when it was compared to something else. And so I would take the time and make sure that everyone was understanding it and just explain it as best as I could. And it, yeah, it just, it clicked for me. And I was able to talk, speak publicly without having to pause for too long to try to find my words. It just all kind of came naturally. Well, and you always spoke very maturely and eloquently. It was just the minute you were asked to write something down, you shut down and you couldn't do it. Well, even if someone asked me to speak on something at length, like specifically, uh, even if it was something that I was prepared for, as soon as I'm doing it, it just shuts down. I mean, even with the interview, I was nervous that I wouldn't be able to talk about being dysgraphic because it's hard to explain. So, yeah. So, um, are, is there any more that you could explain about having dysgraphia so that parents can understand what their kids are going through, experience with? So I think, yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with fine motor skill issues as well. There's, uh, when I was in elementary school and I was learning how to do cursive, I would be kept in from recess because I wasn't able to get my letters quite right or move my hand in quite the right way and um we used to do those figure eight practices and mm -hmm. that helped a lot mm. with getting comfortable with just moving my hand and actually oh interesting it. yeah it doesn't it doesn't make it easier to write out something but it still makes it easier to just use the pencil in general mm -hmm. and i remember i used to say that you had horrible handwriting mm -hmm. And you told me one time you didn't know you had horrible handwriting until I brought that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I had no comparison for it. So when I wrote down, I was able to read it. But and I would always also try to write as fast as I could because I figured if I write fast enough, then I can kind of outrun the blockage, which <laughs> isn't how it works. But that's how your child mind process. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So. So um, the handwriting thing, you didn't compare yourself to your other classmates, your other siblings? So, well, my other siblings, Chris is the only one who really has, like... Olivia had good handwriting, too. I never really saw Olivia write. And Sammy and I kind of both struggled. Well, Sammy a little bit more than myself struggled yeah. with handwriting, so... So kind of... you're better than him. Yeah. Too. And with classmates, I don't think I ever really saw any other classmates' papers. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, no, I can't remember ever seeing any. Um, so what can you say to encourage parents about their child struggling with writing? Uh, be patient, for one. Um, I would say as much as you can, try not to force um, long sessions of sitting down and writing something. Uh, that's just going to backfire. What I've read is 10 minute increments tend to work best when trying to on a task that work on a task that you aren't really wanting to do um, or that may seem tedious. Uh, what else? Be encouraging behind it. Um, when if, if, if your kid decides to take the time to sit down and write something out. Get, encourage them along the way, help them however you can or however way that they're asking to be helped with it, I think is what I would say. 
Now, there was a time when um, you were thinking of going to college and I offered to write all of your papers with you. And um, then you decided that college was not the route for you. Mm -hmm. um, how serious were you thinking about having to write papers in college? I mean, was that a big reason why you decided not to go to college? I think definitely. Um, even now, I'm still, it's something that I think about, but the idea of having to write up papers for stuff. So I, I, whenever I look at a college course, I always think about the mystical courses that I hear where you don't have to write any papers, it's all practical work rather than, which is how I got into trade work because it's mostly practical. Um, yeah, it definitely is still something that prohibits, not prohibits, but I can't think of the word. I think prohibits okay. too. I mean, yeah, they, they, it, it's a stopping a block. Yeah, block. yeah, it's it, it's a road stop on, or a, a road block. A road block. <laughs> it's a roadblock on the idea of moving in with uh, with higher education with, with college. Now, people always say, why not just dictate? Mm -hmm. um, when you were younger and in school, the dictation machines or programs were not very good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah they're was, better now. Yes, but it's it's kind of a once burned, twice shy, I think is the, the phrase, where it's, it's something that I struggled with before, so it's hard to give it a second chance to come back to it. And even then, I still struggle, like I, like I mentioned before, if there's a specific topic that I'm trying to think of the words on, I still struggle trying to bring it out rather than having a natural conversation or something. If it's a natural conversation, I can speak however freely I need to, but yeah. I would say that's that those are the two blocks I have. That one, the frustrations from before. It's kind of a uh, it it remind it reminds me of the frustrations of trying to write itself. That kind of same overly warm feeling in my chest and throat from being anxious about it. Basically, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess that's about it. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing <laughs> this information. And if anyone has questions, um write them below and uh, we'll have Jacob answer them for you. <laughs> <laughs>